There's been a total of 266 Catholic popes since Jesus died. While the modern papacy is mostly about an elected virtuous official inspiring people to be wholesome to each other and also sometimes act as PR in rare cases of people misinterpreting the big guy's old textbook. Back in the day, the church had more than its fair share of bad apples. For most of the Middle Ages and modern times, the church cast a huge shadow over the politics and the day-to-day -day lives of Western civilization. And as they say, with a great headdress comes great recipes for disasters. Now, I don't know exactly who said that outside of me. Welcome to Nutty. Here are some of the most embarrassing popes that made Holy See a whole lot messier. Benedict IX. There's been a total of 15 popes that chose the name Benedict for themselves, but the ninth one was the true D.I.C. who added a silent K to his name. A teenage Benedict IX became the pontiff as he slid into the Holy See surfing on the coattails of his uncle to become the youngest pope in history, a record that he holds to this day. I mean, Joe DiMaggio's record is nothing compared to this. It's alleged by citing how Benedict's brothers have been pope, his granduncle had been pope, two more distant cousins had been pope, the family butler had been pope, the nanny was pope, the guy who delivered the mail to their house was pope, but that wasn't enough, so the count also offered a buttload of cash to the Romans. Are you offering us a bribe? How dare you, sir? This doesn't mean we like your son. And they really didn't. Romans described Benedict IX as a demon from hell. Can you blame Benedict, though? I mean, what would you expect of a teenager being appointed as pope at that age? I mean, what mature thing were you doing when you were a teenager? Yeah, I thought so. Things would go real unpapal real soon. Benedict IX wasted no time to turn the Holy See into his frat house, where he ran through more women than a nail shop during prom season. In fact, Benedict IX was such a Benedict that he didn't give no dams about who he benedicted, with no regard to the gender. What? His not safe for work parties at the office got so loud that the Romans began to think that the man was getting busy with demons themselves. Obviously, Romans sent spaghetti ninjas to get rid of Benedict IX. Ha ha, your nutty days of shenanigans are over, you dirty pope. Wait, wait, who turned off the sun? How is it night all of a sudden? Is, is, is this the end? Is the Lord coming to get us? Oh, oh, okay, wait, wait, guys, it was just an eclipse. <laughs> get it? <laughs> wait, wait, where did that dirty pope go? When the attempt on Benedict IX's life failed, the Romans took matters into their own hands and a mob stormed the Holy See in 1045, forcing Benedict IX to flee Rome. The Romans cheered and elected a new pope, Pope Sylvester III. But Benedict knew Sylvester was weak sauce, and after only seven weeks, he returned to the city and kicked Sylvester III to the curb and reclaimed the throne like nothing had ever happened. Who else is trying to do that these days? Hmm. The Three Popes Now, we would like to ask rhetorically, who'd have seen that coming? But there is an answer to that question. Romans. Romans saw it coming. You see, just a century before Benedict, there was another pope named John XII who was also elected at the mere age of 18, who also turned the papal palace into a brothel and also pissed off all of Rome, only to walk back one day to kick his replacement to the curb and become pope again. And guess who John XII is related to? Ding, 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 yep, this guy, Benedict IX. Interestingly, they both trace back their lineage to Charlemagne. The only difference between John XII and Benedict IX was that John also slept with his relatives along with other women, and he managed to stay incumbent as the Pope until he went to glory. It happened when he was possibly caught on top of the wife of a man who then quickly took John's life. But Benedict IX had pretty different plans. Now, only six weeks after reclaiming the papacy, Benedict IX realized he had enough of abusing the divine authority and he wanted to bail out. But then he thought, hey, I can make money out of this. Because, you know, pimping ain't easy. So he went to his godfather, John Gradium, and offered him the papacy like one would offer their PlayStation 5 to a known person. He asked for 1,500 pounds of gold for the papacy. Now, if you adjust that to today's money, that's about 30 million American dollars. Chuff freaking ching. Can't blame Benedict with that much money, to be honest. He also married his cousin after stepping down. Okay, so there wasn't much to separate between Benedict IX and John XII. But as they say, once a pope, always a pope. And so, after a while, Benedict's rear end once again had the itch to sit on the Holy See. His buyer, John Gradium, who was now called Gregory VI, wasn't having a grand time being Pope. Benedict had emptied the PayPal account, and Rome's crime rate was higher than Bogota, Colombia in the 80s. Okay, maybe not that bad, but you get the point. Oh, and also, Sylvester III was still around too, waiting for the canary to drop and eat it, I guess. That's a Sylvester and Tweety reference, by the way. 
All of a sudden, Rome had a Mexican standoff of popes, and somebody snitched about it to the Holy Roman Emperor Henry III, who was neither holy nor Roman. But let's keep that story for another day, all right? Henry III first arrested Sylvester III for being an imposter, coerced Gregory VI to step down or face the charges for buying the papacy illegally, and waited for Benedict IX to show up. But when he didn't, the king was like, whatever, and he made his favorite German priest the new pope. Now, Benedict did finally show up, precisely after eight months when somehow the new pope was poisoned. It's funny how those kind of coincidences happened back then, right? Benedict claimed the timing was purely coincidental. When asked to prove it, he replied with, trust me, bro, and you know what? <laughs> it friggin' worked. Man, this guy. Another three popes. After John and Benedict, you'd think the church would have learned its lesson, but if that was the case, this video would have been over by now. In the 14th century, they made Urban VI the new pope, and he turned out to be a total prick. I mean, he was an a-hole. So the cardinals regretted making him the pope and tried to overturn the decision. They all started the hashtag NotMyPope, and they moved to Avignon in France and started their own church there. Anyway, the cardinals at Avignon elected Clement VII as their new pope, but Urban VI still had enough supporters to claim the Holy See in Rome. This caused a big crack now known as the Western Schism. Now, why does that matter? Well, there's a lot of boring hierarchy that goes into it, which let's just say is very bureaucratic and boring, and you don't want to dive into that. But to sum it up, the blessing you got from your pastor might mean nothing if it cannot be traced back to the correct pope. That included baptisms, marriages, and last rites. So apparently, about half of the blessings during the schism were considered forgery, and so the society was in a crisis. To clear this up, the council met in 1409 to elect a new pope. So it's decided. Mr. Alexander V will be our new pope, and we don't have to worry about whose blessing is valid and who's not. So Jerry, did you email the notice of termination to the other two popes? I did what now? God damn it, Jerry. Please don't use blasphemies. <sighs> you know what, I hate you so much. So instead of reducing the number of popes by one, the Council of Pisa added one more, and this went on for one more generation until Sigismund became the new emperor and managed to get rid of all three incumbent popes by hook or by crook. Under his guidance, Martin V became the new pope for the first time, and for the first time, an overseeing council was established to monitor popes. Alexander VI over the centuries, there have been dirty popes who would have breakfast with someone's wife in the morning, and then there are popes who would decide to invite the entire society to their night dungeon. For example, Stephen really wanted to get even with his predecessor, Formosus, for some friggin' reason, so he exhumed the dead pope's corpse and had a deacon control the corpse in a courtroom like a puppet just so he can push the old remains into the river for an ego trip. When Alexander VI became the pope, bribing to earn votes was pretty much an open secret of the church. So he did that, and he moved into the papal palace along with his children and mistresses. Alexander VI was said to have an army of henchmen, committing various crimes like extortion, blackmail, robbery, coercion, and even witnessing people fly out of windows and falling on daggers. His favorite mistress during his term as the pope was Giulia Farnese, whose husband was rewarded with his own castle, and her brother was appointed as a cardinal to keep her happy. He showered his sons with a lot of good positions and jobs, until the younger one took the life of the older one. That made Alexander pretty sad for a while before he got over it and resumed showering the younger son, Cesare, with more stations and wealth and eventually facilitated having him become Pope after himself as well. Because, remember kids, nothing ensures success like nepotism. Thanks for watching Nutty. If you had fun watching this video, do like and share the video. And hit the subscribe button to watch more videos like this one in the future. And who knows, maybe the next time you watch, you'll be the Pope.